Bueno, para uh, los participantes que hablan inglés, uh, for those button at the bottom of your page to English. We'll be doing most of the moderation in Spanish. Okay, buenos dias. Bienvenidos. Right, good morning. Welcome to the last session of the virtual meeting, clinical research as a tool for addressing the cancer battle in Latin America. I'm Desha Kristen from Cancer Research and Biostatistics, the Statistics Center of SWAG, and one of the founding members of the initiative in Latin America. I am moderating this panel with Dr. Jorge Gamboa from the San Borja Arriaran Hospital and University of Chile. Some technical notes, if this is the first time you're joining this session, if you are calling from a phone without Zoom app, you will just have the audio, not video. In case you have questions for panelists, please write them down in the Q&A icon. If you have connectivity problems, we have some suggestions you can try. First, you can get closer to the server. You can connect your computers directly to the internet, or you can turn off Zoom and reconnect to the session. We are using interpretation, and this afternoon, all of the sessions will be in English. So you can use interpretation and choose Spanish, if so, you so wish. A disclaimer, the intention of the interpretation services is to promote a better understanding of the conference, but this does not replace the original. No person or entity will be liable for errors, omissions, or ambiguities in the interpretation provided during the conference. In the first session, we heard from three panelists that presented studies with three very different designs. Dr. Egiguren discussed a study with a qualitative component, the purpose of which was to improve the fragmentation of healthcare in Chile. Dr. Tami presented a study on smoking cessation using a mobile app, and Dr. Acosta presented a study of surveillance in the case of patients that already received treatment for cervical cancer. Dr. Acosta and Dr. Tami presented some options for collaboration for studies in Latin America with them and they sent their contact information. If you're interested, you can get in touch with Bettina Mueller, one of us, and uh, we can organize. Now, later, well, in the second session, rather, we have three speakers who will present about opportunities for research in the area of symptom management, palliative care. And then we will have a presentation about a study design in cancer control and prevention. Jorge, you have the floor to introduce the first panelist. The first panelist will speak about opportunities of research to manage symptoms. Dr. Lynn Henry. She is a medical oncologist from the uh, University of Michigan Royal Cancer Center. Her research is on the toxicity of endocrine treatment, co-president of SWOG in the symptoms and quality of life. She, she collaborates with SWOG colleagues everywhere to conduct research to assess studies on symptoms. And also contributes with results informed by patients to therapeutic studies. Doctor, you recognized. 
Can you hear me okay and see the slides? Yes, we can. Okay, and you just see the one slide? Perfect. Yes. Okay. So thank you very much for this opportunity. Um, as mentioned, I'm Lynn Henry. I am the co-chair of symptom management and quality of life for SWOG and have been so with uh, Dr. Michael Fish uh, for the past five years or so. And so I've been tasked with talking about research opportunities for symptom management um, that we can perform uh, through SWOG and within Latin America. So just to briefly uh, mention what I'm going to talk about today, I'm gonna to just do a brief description of symptom management and quality of life uh, program in SWOG, giving a highlight of um, symptom management and patient reported outcomes. I'm gonna examine opportunities for conducting symptom management trials in Latin America and talk about a few upcoming trials which um, are or will be hopefully available uh, to um, participants uh, within Latin America. And then also discuss some potential challenges for symptom management and quality of life trials. So just as a really brief overview, when, we're talk when you talk about quality of life, you're really talking about evaluating all aspects of life, health-related and non-health-related. And then when we talk about patient-reported outcomes, that is literally anything reported by the patient. So really for most of what we are talking about here, we're talking about sort of the subset of that, which is related specifically to health-related quality of life. So the impact of illness or treatment, on many different aspects of quality of life. You know, whenever we think about um, conducting specific symptom management trials or whenever we think about adding patient reported outcomes to disease treatment trials, we always want to make sure that we have a hypothesis driven research question. We don't want to just collect data about patient symptoms for the sake of collecting data. Um, it does have burden whenever we ask people to complete questionnaires. And so we want to try to limit that to exactly what we want to capture. We of course want to use validated instruments. We don't just want to you know, randomly ask questions that we made up. And then we want to really make sure that whenever we're deciding when to ask patients questions about their symptoms, that it makes sense from a biological standpoint. We obviously like to have baseline symptoms, uh, but then when we, just, we think very carefully about which time points to collect symptoms during the study and not just you know, every single time point. And part of that reason is because the more questions you ask and the more time points you have, the more likely you will be to have missing data. And so we wanna try to limit that as much as possible to make our, our results as valid as possible. And so that's why we take all of these things into consideration. Whenever we're thinking about instruments to choose, there's a huge variety to choose from, and they come in different flavors. So you can have global quality of life measures where you're really just, how is the patient doing overall? You can look at symptoms or function scales, physical function, emotional function, and look at that in a multi-dimensional way. So you ask multiple questions to get at how is someone's physical function? You don't just ask them, can you walk down the block? There are a number of different sort of groups of um, questionnaires available. There's the PROMISE, which are nice and short. Um, they are available as computer adaptive testing if that is available, although we don't usually use that in SWOG. There's also other organizations that have developed questionnaires, including FACT, including EORTC. And then in addition to those multidimensional scales, you can also just ask about individual symptoms. You know. And one of the good, um, more recent developed um, questions for that relates to the pro-CTCAE. So that's the typical physician um, toxicity grading assessment, but you actually ask the patient how things are going. You're technically measuring adverse events, um, but what it does is it assesses the severity, interference, and frequency. And for example, a patient can probably tell you more about his or her fatigue or nausea than a physician can. So we can get some very useful information. Now within SWOG itself, we have a number of different NCORE committees, which I'm sure you've heard about during this week. And the three in particular that are related to symptom management are symptom control and quality of life, survivorship and palliative care and end of life. And in a sense, these are somewhat um, arbitrary designations um, because you can find different types of trials in different types in, in all three committees. And you'll hear from Dr. Kraus right after me, who is co-chair of palliative care and end of life. Now within SWOG, we also have sort of three approaches to how we develop these studies. 
One is simply adding patient reported outcomes measures to disease trials. So these are trials that are gonna be treating breast cancer or myeloma or something like that. And then we add on patient reported outcomes to that. We now have a pro core that's led by Dr. Vaya specifically um, helping the, the study chairs of the disease treatment trials um, to add on quality of life assessments to their trials. We also sometimes will develop symptom focused observational studies and I'll tell you about one of those. And then finally, symptom management interventional trials where obviously we're trying to help uh, with an actual pharmacologic or behavioral intervention uh, to try to improve symptoms in patients with cancer. So these are just two um, current or upcoming examples of disease focused trials that have a quality of life endpoint. The first one is SWOG 1802, which is comparing standard systemic therapies to therapy plus local therapy, either surgery or radiation for metastatic prostate cancer. And the primary outcome is overall survival, which is why it sits in the GU group, not in our committee. Uh, but key secondary outcomes here are related to urinary symptoms, which is very important if half of the group is getting a local intervention on their prostate and half isn't other prostate related symptoms, and also things like decisional regret. You know, are they, are they um, unhappy about, this, uh, about the decision that they made um, about what intervention to undergo? Secondly is a trial that is almost activated. Um, this is looking at rituximab and mini CHOP with or without an investigational agent, specifically in elderly patients with newly diagnosed diffuse large B cell lymphoma. So again, here, the primary outcome is overall survival, at least for the phase three. Um, but there are key secondary outcomes. You know, this is an elderly patient, 75 and older. So they really wanna look at feasibility of doing a study. That's not really a patient reported outcome, but they wanna look at frailty status and they wanna look at a geriatric assessment. And so that includes both input from the physician, but also input direct from the patient, both objective and subjective um, about you know, what their performance status and quality of life is like. So these are just two examples among many of disease-focused trials that we've done. Now, whenever we're trying to include patient-reported outcomes into this, we want to really say, what is the question we're trying to answer? Again, getting at this hypothesis issue. You know, do we want to ask, are the symptoms of the disease improving with the treatment? Is function improving separate from individual symptoms? Um, are the side effects too bothersome? And do they differ between treatment arm? And then are the side effects exacerbated potentially because of pre-existing conditions in the patient? So these are all different things that you can try to address within a study. And then they, importantly, the patient-reported outcomes can sometimes provide additional benefit, additional information to allow patients, to allow physicians to assess the overall risk and benefit of an intervention when they're sitting in an office trying to make a decision about, is this treatment right for me or not? So they can play a very important role. Switching gears a little bit to observational studies. So for symptom management, um, sorry, for um, the symptom of neuropathy and specifically taxane induced neuropathy, we have the currently ongoing study SWOG 1714. And so this is actually following people prospectively um, during chemotherapy and we have a set number of uh, chemos that we're including. So objective and subjective assessment of neuropathy. We want to look at predictors of development of toxicity and look specifically at biomarkers. This trial has been going on for a while now, since February, 2019, and it is now available in Latin American sites. So additional details about the study, it is um, in planning to enroll a thousand patients. I think they have about just over 300 so far. Patients will have stage one through three breast, ovarian, and lung cancer, so no metastatic disease and there are specific standard regimens that are being included. There are multiple assessments over a one year time period, some specifically during the taxane chemotherapy itself and some uh, longer term follow-up to see what happens with neuropathy. And then importantly, there are two types of patient reported outcomes. There's both a subjective outcomes, namely the PROMISE 29, which is looking at general symptoms as well as a physical activity questionnaire. And then there are three objective assessments. There's NeuroPen, Tuning Fork, and the time to get up and go. Um, and the NeuroPen and Tuning Fork are provided by the study. So that's just one example of um, an ongoing study. I'll talk in a minute about one that's just now getting started. 
And then switching further to the third bucket of trials, these are interventional trials to try to improve symptoms. Um, just as examples, we've conducted three studies recently uh, looking at aromatase inhibitor associated arthralgias. Uh, one looked at a pharmaceutical agent, duloxetine, one looked at a supplement, omega-3 fatty acids, and one looked at acupuncture. Um, there's an ongoing trial right now looking at carvedilol to try to help prevent development of cardiotoxicity um, in patients with metastatic breast cancer treated with trastuzumab. We've also done interventional studies before looking at treatments for neuropathy. So there've been a number of different um, interventional studies. These are just a few. So now, you know, that's the type of studies that we do within SWOG. So what type might be specifically applicable for Latin American sites? So some things to think about, and I know people have been thinking about this, it's clear from uh, listening to the talks earlier, is we want to ask questions that pharmaceutical companies usually aren't interested in. So you might want to compare two standard regimens to assess tolerance, something that pharma is probably not going to do. Um, Non-pharmacologic approaches um, or can be uh, helpful. Uh, behavioral interventions can be studied. Telemedicine strategies can be studied. Sometimes supplements can be studied because they aren't under patent. Um, and then finally, de-escalation strategies. I mean, there have been a lot of these where we want to try to give the minimum amount of treatment that we really need to give while still getting excellent disease outcomes. So can we get away with giving less radiation, less chemotherapy? This has been shown in breast cancer in a number of occasions, and this is something that is perfect uh, for SWOG to conduct. Other opportunities, there are many relevant questions we can ask. You can think about uh, symptom experience, which may differ depending on uh, the cultural and sociological backgrounds of the patients. Um, there can be inherited genetic effects that differ by race and ethnicity. Uh, financial toxicity, and I know there's a one that we're probably going to discuss tomorrow related to that. And then also different aspects of healthcare delivery. And as you saw earlier, there's you know, some telehealth things can be studied, mobile apps, things that are um, generalizable and uh, more easily to disseminatable um, if you get positive results from your study. But then, of course, there are going to be barriers. And so for drug studies, um, IND can be an issue, um, but you do have issues with drug distribution. You have issues with um, clearance through customs. Um, sometimes the issue is just the standard of care arm of the treatment may not be standard in a given country. And then there isn't any mechanism by which to purchase those drugs because they're not covered by the SWOG trial. Um, as Dr. Krauss might mention, you also need to understand the idiosyncrasies of each in institution and country to really anticipate and overcome roadblocks um, to approval. Um, I know that he had a number of those issues with his trial. And then finally, for studies with translational endpoints, which are very exciting to conduct, you know, you're collecting samples, you're collecting tissues. And so are there issues with shipping? Are there issues with releasing samples across the border? Are there issues with cost? And so, and more importantly, I guess, are your samples gonna melt before they make it to the United States? And so there are different things you always have to think about and plan ahead. So then for non-therapeutic trials, um, especially for ones containing uh, patient reported outcomes, um, both for the behavioral intervention itself, is it available in the right language? And then also for the instruments where you're collecting the symptoms, are they av available in the right language? And importantly, have they been linguistically and psychometrically validated? Um, there can also be some funding issues. Um, it can be challenging sometimes to get funding to cover patient-reported outcome collection. We do have a mechanism within SWOG to be able to collect a limited number, but if you want to collect a lot, that does generally require additional funding sources. Touching on the PROs in Spanish issue, because I know it will come up tomorrow, um, Multiple instruments have been validated in Spanish or in the process of being validated in Spanish. Of course, Spanish is not the same in every single country that speaks Spanish. And so that can become an issue as well and has to be taken into consideration. Uh, but the big groups, PROMIS, PROCTCAE, EORTC, FACT, these all um, have many of their instruments that are already um, available in Spanish. And so definitely Spanish is one of the languages that we are often able to expand um, the eligibility to include.
So this is just two quick studies that are um, currently in development. Uh, this first one is an interventional study looking at mindfulness for quality of life in castrate sensitive prostate cancer. It was actually just submitted as an R01 last week. So we don't yet know if this will uh, obtain funding. Uh, but the intervention is looking at headspace mindfulness intervention versus weightless control. Um, it will include romantic partners. So they're enrolling dyads at patients and, and partners, not just patients themselves. And it will be available in both English and Spanish because headspace is now available in Spanish. The primary outcome is looking at change in quality of life based on the FACT prostate score. Um, and then secondarily, they're looking at other symptoms, not just overall quality of life, and also looking at change in quality of life in the partners, because if the partners are doing better, the patients might and vice versa. So they're going to take a look at that as well. Quedan cinco minutos, five minutes remaining. Just looking at the study design overview, um, patients will be enrolled, have to have at least a certain level of distress. Uh, to be eligible, they get randomized, and they either receive the headspace intervention or, or usual care for six weeks. Um, they have an assessment at that time, then everyone is just sort of following up for the next six weeks, and that's the final time point. After that time, the patients who were in the usual care arm and their caregivers will be able to receive headspace for the year. So this has approval from headspace, um, but they need additional funding to be able to conduct the study, and that is what the R01 was submitted for. The other protocol I just wanted to mention, and actually the, the protocol itself was submitted to DCP um, shortly before this um, session this afternoon. Um, this is an immune checkpoint inhibitor toxicity intervention, I'm oh, sorry, not intervention, an observational study. And so patients starting treatment with an immunotherapy-based therapy, so you can't have concurrent chemo or targeted therapy, just immunotherapy therapy on its own, can't be part of participating in a clinical trial because we want to look at sort of more real-world outcomes. Patients will undergo serial uh, patient-reported outcomes in pro-CTCAE for a year, also have some limited blood collection. And really the primary outcome is to look for risk prediction model for developing high-grade immune-related adverse events. So this is similar to the neuropathy study that's ongoing, but for immunotherapy. And as I said, this uh, we have had some initial discussions and hope to um, have this available um, in Latin America. So we will be working on that as we move forward. Other potential ideas you can do secondary analyses um, of pre-existing data or samples from SWOG studies. Um, you can always talk with committee chairs or the study chair of the actual study to find out what was collected and what hasn't been done yet and can apply for funds from the Hope Foundation to try to get some support, at least for the statistical analyses that doesn't cover um, support for the actual analyses of samples, for example. So what is the optimal approach? You know, we there's the possibility of adding Latin American sites to trials primarily being conducted in the United States. And those are the ones we've mostly talked about this afternoon. Uh, want to be very proactive though and consider Latin American sites obviously from the very beginning. And I think we're doing that more and more as we are developing newer studies. Um, want to make sure that there is support to help guide through the process so we know exactly how to do that. And, but we also want to, when we're doing that, we're selecting trials, we want to make sure that the questions that are being addressed in those, question, in those trials are applicable to Latin America. Want to make sure we're including the right instruments, the right interventions, and that it's feasible. Obviously, there's all the other different approaches of developing trials from within Latin America, trying to bring them the other direction. I know we're talking about a lot of different um, trials throughout this meeting, which are all very exciting, and I look forward to the breakout session tomorrow. Um, but I hope this was a useful overview of symptom management trials um, and how, how we can apply them in Latin America. And I um, look forward to answering any questions during the breakout session. Thank you very much. Muchas gracias, Dr. Henry, por su presentación. Thank you, Dr. Henry, for your presentation. And thank you for showing some opportunities for participation in symptom management trials. Now I'm going to introduce the next panel member, but before that, I would like to invite you to write your questions on question and answer icon. The next panelist is Dr. Robert Krauss, Professor of Surgery at the University of Pennsylvania, 
head of service of surgery at the Veteran Medical Center in Philadelphia, and he's co-chair of the Committee for Palliative Care. And end of life, SWOG. He's an uh, oncologist surgeon. He's interested in skin cancer, GI tract cancer, sarcoma of soft tissue, and endocrine tumors. His research revolves around cancer survival, including palliative care and end of life care. Welcome, Dr. Krauss. Thank you. Can you can you hear me okay? Great, okay. Well, I appreciate the opportunity. Um, some of what I'll say will overlap with some of the other speakers, but that's okay. Um, the, the, within the cancer control committees, there is a, it's, a comp it's a continuum. I'll be talking about um, some opportunities within survivorship and palliative care. I previously was the co-chair at survivorship and now at palliative care, um, but there clearly is um, a continuum, but the most important thing is getting great, great studies on, um, and we all get along, so that's that's important. Um, I have no disclosures. So once again, a lot of the comments may be uh, similar, but from a little different angle. And so, some what are some of the criteria that may make it easier to accrue patients or put? Uh, in Latin America or have trials, swag trials open in Latin America. First of all, the outcome measures should be very straightforward. The eligibility criteria should be simple. Uh, limited technology requirements. We don't want things that may not be obviously um, available readily. The surveys, as just mentioned, must be validated in Spanish. They just they shouldn't just be sort of retranslated, but they have to be used and reused and known in Spanish. Limited patient burden. And as stated before, standard of care interventions are, are really best. So, you know, it's best with non-experimental drugs if possible or treatment. And that's one of the reasons why surgical trials may so be so ad advantageous. So I'm gonna show the, an example of uh, S 1316, the malignant bowel obstruction study. Some of my slides will have a little Spanish in them, but I will talk in English. So the premise was very simple and uh, something that many surgeons encounter is there really isn't a, a, a optimal algorithm for many patients who have a malignant bowel obstruction. And we're talking of small bowel obstruction. And so what is really optimal, surgery or non-surgery? And so, we had this schema, which was novel in that we, it was um, patients were randomized or non-randomized. Every patient had to have the same criteria to be randomized, which I'll go over. But you know, it's, it's difficult to randomize patients uh, with advanced cancer, and, so, and that was recognized. So to augment uh, the, that group, we have a larger non-randomized. And this was the actual numbers that we um, were able to attain. Um, the eligibility criteria were simple. Um, basically, it had to be the patient had to be a surgical candidate, reasonable to operate on the patient, and there was equipoise within the surgical team. It, it, it couldn't be sure whether the patient would do better with a surgical or non-surgical approach. They had to have malignant bowel obstruction by certain criteria. We we're focusing on intra-abdominal cancers, including retroperitoneal cancers, but not lung, the rare lung or melanoma breast. Couldn't be in an emergency situation that was less of a choice and reasonable performance status the week before. The endpoint was pretty straightforward. It was days out of the hospital and alive at three months. Three months of being about the median survival. We followed the patients out for a year. And then we had multiple second, uh, secondary endpoints. One of them was looking at uh, dietary recalls, and that was emanated from the University of Arizona with Spanish-speaking um, counselors who would interview the patients. We used two surveys or two patient report outcomes. One was the MD Anderson symptom inventory, GI, 
well used in Spanish and translated. And the EQ5D, which of course is in a European instrument, that's one, an instrument we can ultimately look at uh, quality adjusted life years. And uh, so well validated instruments. Looking also at things, straightforward things like morbidity and survival. So how did we do? So, so basically, so we're completed accrual as of May, and you can see Tennessee and Northwell, Northwell's in Long Island, New York, the two highest accruers, um, and then uh, University of Arizona, University of Kansas. And then you see at eight, um, Mexico, uh, seven patients from uh, Peru, and one patient from Colombia. And I will tell you that we would have had a lot higher numbers from our Latin American colleagues if we didn't run into a lot of the issues with opening trials in Latin America. And I'll talk about that, some of the administrative issues. But ultimately, where our Latin American colleagues made a huge mark is every single patient that was accrued from Latin America was put on the randomized arm. So that was 16 patients. So a large percentage of the uh, 55 were um, from Latin America. And we see that in some of our demographics. So we were really well matched as far as age and gender, relatively well matched as far as race. And this is between the surgery and non-surgery arms, including everybody, randomized and non-randomized. We were very well matched with Hispanic um, Hispanics as well, as well as um, the tumor type. Where we see some large differences is um, the randomized arm versus the patient choice arm. And we see some differences in race in that Tennessee, which was the highest accruer of randomized patients, um, have a, a, um, a large number of African-Americans, but you also see other as a large percentage different than the patient choice. And some of that has to do with our Latin American colleagues where patients are, or may have uh, be native um, or, or, or Indian um, um, descent. Also, you can see because of our Latin American colleagues that we had a larger number or larger percentage of Hispanics in the randomized arm. These are great things. We're pretty proud of this. We're pretty proud about the number of patients that um, are minority origin in the study, which is often very hard to do. Once again, you can see we're very well matched as far as the tumor type. So some of the things that uh, we, we implemented into this study um, is, well, first of all, there's always a web page for all SWOG studies, um, but we also, we did have some Spanish materials within the study. Um, and so, um, including a, a brochure to give patients and their families. Monthly coordinator calls were all across the United States and included Latin American um, uh, participants, although Latin American, uh, sites rarely participated in that one. We had monthly accrual updates, um, including uh, the graphs that I showed you before, so that you know different sites can know where they were. But one of the things that helped us most was when we started having monthly team calls with our Latin American sites, and that was all three sites. And of course, not everyone could participate every time, but it was incredibly helpful in um, answering questions, going over, is this patient eligible? I ran into this problem. And we had, um, as part of it, the, um, there, we had a translator. And so it, it facilitated things. And so that I really wanted people to speak what they felt more, most comfortable so we could all understand each other. Um, and, it, and having those monthly calls, I think helped tremendously in, in, in the accrual process. I want to give another example of where some of the cultural differences, some of the things that we learned that we really had to pay more attention to or certainly understood where some of the delays were. SWOG consents have their own wording, fairly standard, especially now that it's in the central IRB out of the National Cancer Institute. Of course, Latin American countries cannot participate in the central IRB. So one question on the consent was, what happens if I'm injured or hurt because I took part in this study? 
the answer in the in the American or um, consent is this study sponsors will not offer to pay for medical treatment or for injury. Your insurance company may not be willing to pay for this study related injury. If you have if you have no insurance, you would be responsible for any cost. Well, our study was two um, pretty two standards of care is unlikely to be related to this, but this was a real stumbling block. And so um, in Mexico, which was ultimately shared, the same question, the answer was, in case you experience damages related to the research study, you will get adequate care and treatment at the Instituto Nacional de Cancerologia without cost for you. It never would have gone through without this wording. Um, I'm not going to spend time on this slide, but this is an example. Every country is a little bit different on their timelines, some of the bureaucratic agencies that it has to go through. Um, and quite honestly, this is a timeline that was not, uh, this is the, you know, what was given to us from the each site, but it's it wasn't really reasonable. And in some instances, it really took years before um, sites were open. It was very difficult for us to understand. Um, ultimately, all three were able to be open, but it did. It, it these timelines weren't exactly reasonable. But I did understand that there's lots of hoops to go through. Of course, we, we don't we don't know about Chile, and I try to get information before this, and so it'll be inf important for us to understand, you know, sort of all the different hoops that need to go through to get a trial open. So what are some of the barriers and what are some of our solutions? Well, first of all, language is obviously a major barrier. And so uh, this is where uh, SWAG is instituted. Um, the translation is coordinated through Mexico by Dr. Mora. And she is an incredibly valuable resource to SWAG in Latin America. And, um, and so, and there's also volunteers at each site to help with the translation and of course, uh, different dialects. Not every, as just Dr. Henry just says, not every, all Spanish is equal. Clearly, so uh, cultural differences. You know, one thing we found out with our food diaries is that there are regional foods, and this was uh, especially uh, we saw with Peru. And so we had to, um, you know, specially meet with our dietary counseling people so that they understood some of those regional foods. Dialects, Family decision making, very important in Latin America. That's different. Um, potentially more limited literacy. And then uh, one of the things that SWAG is very interested in is, is the advocate population and ensuring that there's local advocate involvement. Administratively, Dr. Mohar has his taking control has helped tremendously the efforts um, in Latin America. Um, and, and his leadership with the monthly meetings and, and oversight has really been helpful. There was a member, membership specialist who um, left recently and hopefully that person will be named uh, soon. Um, and here is a website for you all to have, member at swag.org. And SWAG wanted me to make sure I included this in my presentation. You know, this is until we get um, that membership specialist. If there are specific questions, this is the place to go. Now, the delays in, appro of, in approval were um, sort of confounding. They they were difficult, and it really is important to sort of try and understand the systems in each country. One of the other things we found is that there are recurring local and NCI approvals that sometimes slip through the cracks. And we did lose several patients because they were not updated. And those are the things that need special attention needs to be made to. So communication, that's always an issue. It is the primary issue. The monthly calls that Dr. Mohar leads is very important. Each individual study, I believe, having their own virtual calls with the Latin American sites. Um, I thought was um, very important. And then relying on experienced teams in place, I've focused a lot on Dr. Mora, but as other teams gain more experience, relying on each other um, is, is um, really an important part of the puzzle. Um, SWAG intends to have a uh, Latin American workbench eventually where a lot of the sort of policies and ongoing updates uh, can, will be there in one site as well as document separately each, each country's 
regulations and policies. One issue that we um, s sort of occurred, and it occurs really everywhere uh, that, that has um, that is swab trials in the United States and Latin America is staff turnover, but that it can really be difficult because things sort of stop. So that's where communication and depending on experienced teams um, and what resources are in place to swag are, are especially important. So I'm gonna give a few examples, um, sort of like what Dr. Henry just did. These are sort of, these are some studies that are in different levels of development, but I, there are types of trials I think could open in Latin America, specifically Chile, potentially. Um, and so I'm gonna, one is a surgery in advanced cancer, symptom toxicity monitoring, early palliative care, and medical aid in dying, which, which may not be available in Chile now, but could in, in the future. Now, very briefly, I'm gonna go through these really quickly. So, so one of our investigators, Dr. Deneve, who's in Tennessee, and he was the number one accruer to S1316, would like to look at laparoscopic hyperthermic intraperitoneal chemotherapy for high volume peritoneal carcinomatosis focusing on uh, colorectal and, ad, and appendiceal cancers. When mentioning this or at the previous meetings, a lot of the surgeons, Latin American surgeons were excited about this. They knew they could put patients on this study. We were gonna have the same outcome measures pretty much as the um, S1316, things that people knew and understood and simple. The eligibility criteria are essentially patients who have these advanced peritoneal disease cancers and they cannot be completely debulked. Um, and then the question is, is can HIPEC be of any benefit? So a, a study of the, the study design would be patients get their chemotherapy, they get a laparoscopy. If they are, um, they would be then randomized if it was unresectable to either stop or then go on uh, and just get chemotherapy or get the HIPEC and then get um, systemic chemotherapy along with it. This is undergoing pilot study right now, and we're hoping this would potentially be involved in, in about a year and a half to two years. Another example of a pretty straightforward study that could be done uh, within Latin America is using real-time feedback uh, to monitor toxicity. The study that we're potentially going to open up is, uh, is in, focusing on advanced renal cell cancer. Dr. Fung, who's at University of Rochester, would be the chair. And really, can this tool um, um, improve survival for patients with advanced uh, renal cell cancer? I know it was said before that, you know, survival studies can be in the palliative care committee too, um, uh, depending on, you know, uh, the other things you're looking at. And of course, focusing on patients with advanced cancer. Survival, of course, does matter. Importantly, this, this study would also look at healthcare utilization, incredibly important. Five minutes left. And then um, CareVive software can be in Spanish, um, online, patients give their tox, give a baseline, then further toxicities, then the healthcare team can assess these online. Currently, this is a pilot. Uh, this is hoped to be completed in the spring. And then we would hope to uh, start a, a SWOG trial in September of 2022. Um, clearly, this could be a study that could be opened in Latin America. This is a study, uh, S2016, which is actually um, potentially is funded by a R01. It got a very close score waiting to hear. This is for patients with advanced pa um, pancreatic cancer. Um, using an intervention to improve quality of life. And the, it is to determine a quality of life in three months for patients with advanced pancreatic cancer, anticipate, uh, participating in a personalized care plan delivered by centralized nurse practitioners versus attention control arm or an arm that has you know, certain things um, embedded into it, but not this particular intervention. Of course, these nurse practitioners would be Spanish speaking. Um, and these would be phone calls. And, um, and then secondarily, we would assess symptoms and also caregiver outcomes. And so this would be the, um, the study schema. Um, and essentially, as I said, it's a pretty simple study, uh, not easy to do, but simple, randomized patients with advanced pancreatic cancer to this intervention. And then the attention control arm would be calls, 
but they were you know, mirroring calls without the specific intervention. So if the patients do get some attention, do they, um, um, is it really the intervention that's of benefit? Now, the last study that I'm just gonna briefly mention is probably not available to Chile right now because I don't believe that um, medical aid in dying is um, legal yet, but you know, things are changing and, and um, likely it will be uh, legal in the future, if not now. I believe it's legal in Colombia now. And so that's one of the countries we will hopefully target. This is a, another pretty simple um, study that's very difficult to do. It's basically to understand the prevalence of depression in patients who request medical aid in dying. And then we're gonna assess several secondary outcome measures, mostly to try and understand if we can attain a phase three study or a larger comparative study with a, a specific psychological intervention for patients who request this and have signs of depression. So there, th these are for patients who have their first request for MAID, um, cannot have had a previous a history of um, suicide attempt. This is the very simple schema. Um, and basically for the, this initial study, um, and then hopefully down the line, this would become a, a larger comparative study. So a couple of final slides. Can studies originating in Latin America be accomplished in SWALK? So this was, um, you know, people have mentioned this, but there's a couple of things of real import. Number one is they must be relevant to US populations also. So things that go through and they emanate from Chile, they certainly can, but they have to be relevant to US populations as well. As well. And they must also include SWOG sites. So it can't just accrue in Chile or other Latin American sites, but also have to accrue at least in one United States site. And then there's lots of other potential hurdle, hurdles as mentioned, such as can you clear customs and will companies support the drug distribution, which is a very big deal. So finally, some conclusions. There are many opportunities for the NCI um, of Chile to participate in SWOG studies. It's really important to um, identify investigators and PIs from Chile um, and SWOG PIs to be in real communication. And barriers can be overcome. They may be difficult, but you, you know we need leadership um, communication, resources, um, and most importantly, patience. So I appreciate um, your attention and I look forward to the panel session. Bien. Um, gracias, Dr. Krause. Thank uh, you, Dr. Krause. Now I'm going to introduce Dr. Joe Unger, who will speak about statistical problems in cancer control research. Doctor is assistant member of the Center for Cancer Research, Fred Hutchinson, and he is by statistician and senior investigator a statistician of the SOC Committee of Control of Symptoms and Quality of Life, and he's the leader of patient reported outcomes. Dr. Unger is part of the Committee Management of Symptoms and Quality of Life of the Cancer Committee of the United States as being principal biostatistician in high profile trials published in New England Journal of Medicine, JAMA, and Journal of Clinical Oncology. Dr. Onga, you recognized. Thank you. Uh, it's great to be here. I'm going to try to share my screen. Do you see it? Yeah, but it's a small slide. If you could, there, there it is. Perfect. Okay. All right. Um, so, uh, yeah, th thank you. It's, it's great to be here. I'm very, um, uh, sorry, I wasn't. Uh, we I couldn't be there in person, uh, as none of us could. Uh, maybe someday. Um, but uh, I, I wanted to talk today about statistical and design issues in cancer control and prevention trials, and <clears throat> I wanted to um, excuse me start at a thirty thousand foot level 
by noting that the cancer control, the cancer control and prevention research is really premised on the idea that it's uh, better to prevent a case of cancer than to, than to have to treat it once it occurs, which although of course both approaches are necessary. Um, and that reducing the side effects and suffering from cancer and its treatments is vital to people's well-being, um, especially since a cancer diagnosis uh, is likely central to a patient's life for the remainder of their life. So with these thoughts in mind, uh, I wanted to start off by identifying what I consider to be some main, some key thematic differences between uh, treatment and cancer control uh, trials. So in treatment trials, the emphasis is gonna be on outcomes directly related to survival, whereas in cancer control and prevention trials, the emphasis is gonna be on outcomes that represent a broader assessment of the impact of disease on its treatments. <clears throat> and in fact, this distinction underlies uh, many of the differences uh, between the programs, which I will outline. Uh, so this, uh, obviously this, this has implications for the thematic differences uh, in that the studies will have different objectives leading to different endpoints and interventions, which result in different designs and ultimately, um, of course, different uh, analysis approaches. So just to start off, because the objectives are gonna be different, the endpoints are gonna be different. Uh, in treatment studies, the main objective is to identify the clinical results of the treatment. Whereas in cancer control and prevention studies, we emphasize primary and secondary prevention, surveillance, screening, symptom control, quality of life, which has been discussed extensively, survivorship and epidemiology, as well as cancer care delivery research which the NCI defines as seeking to improve clinical outcomes and patient well-being by intervening on patient, clinician, and organizational factors that influence care delivery. So because the objectives are different, of course, the endpoints are gonna be different. Uh, for treatment trials, we're looking at tumor response and various flavors of different survival outcomes, whereas in cancer control and prevention studies, the endpoints can be as diverse as patient reported outcomes, disease incidents, um, incidents of adverse events and treatment side effects, and even financial outcomes. And because these objectives are different, uh, the interventions are also gonna be different. Uh, treatment trials rely primarily on systemic cytotoxic or other systemic therapies, surgery and radiation therapy, whereas cancer control and prevention studies can be, again, as diverse as technological interventions, supplements, uh, organizational interventions, or uh, physician-level interventions, such as uh, report cards. And finally, whereas uh, treatment trials are primarily, for instance, single phase one or single arm phase one or two trials, a randomized phase two or three trials. Um, cancer control and prevention trials will include cohort studies or registries, uh, randomized uh, phase two trials, novel hybrid designs such as the one uh, that Dr. Krauss discussed and uh, multi-level uh, designs. Also treatment trials collect uh, data primarily at the patient level, whereas NCORE studies are gonna be collecting uh, data, for instance, at the physician and clinic level or aggregate data. And lastly, given these different designs, there will also be different analytic approaches. Uh, in the treatment trial setting, we rely primarily on survival analysis, whereas in the cancer control and prevention setting, we will commonly use logistic or, or linear regression. Uh, straightforward rate estimation with considerations for weighting in prospective uh, cohort studies. Uh, we will do risk uh, prediction analyses, as has been uh, described by Dr. Henry, that include test validation approaches in a prospective fashion that can utilize cross-validation, um, or and also a linear mix models for, for uh, multi-level data. And for those of us on the SWOG Statistical Center side or familiar with our our reporting mechanisms, I would say nowhere is the difference between these different, uh, these uh, 
these different paradigms more obvious than the use of our standard uh, reporting system, which is designed for survival analysis, whereas I've rarely uh, been able to use it in a straightforward fashion for our uh, reporting of our cancer control studies. So in summary, uh, as shown in this uh, schematic, the different thematic differences between treatment and cancer control studies will impact the entire spectrum of study conduct from development through its publication, which can also be influential with respect to the impact of the findings themselves. Uh, this this uh, next slide is a bit of a, I guess I would call it a fun slide. Uh, it's an illustration of how a few years ago we assessed the scientific impact as measured by citation rates of successfully completed large uh, treatment trials in SWOG in the, in the uh, gray as compared to that of SWOG's two large chemo prevention trials, which admittedly is a, is a, a bit of a biased subset of the cancer control and prevention world. But nonetheless, it shows that the citation patterns for the primary articles as well as for the secondary articles associated uh, with the uh, chemo prevention trials was much, much greater than, um, than for the treatment trials on average. Uh, although of course as well, the investment costs in these trials has to be considered. Uh, I just wanted to provide uh, yet another example. Unfortunately, it doesn't overlap uh, with any that uh, were previously discussed about viral prevalence in cancer patients, which is a study that we recently conducted uh, based on the understanding that universal screening for important potential viral infections is not routine in oncology practice and experts uh, disagree about whether it, in fact it should be performed. Uh, moreover, the prevalence of these viruses in cancer patients is unknown as is the extent to which cancer patients uh, may be aware of their uh, viral infection status when they first go to their, you know, see their oncologist. So to examine this, we conducted SWOG S1204 in which we attempted to screen for these events in a representative fashion uh, in a set of newly diagnosed cancer patients. The key features of this study included um, reliance on a limited set of institutions who all agreed to implement viral screening as routine care in their practice, um, as well as to collect aggregate monthly data on all patients to determine a, a denominator um, in order to inform any uh, necessary uh, adjustments uh, or weighting uh, of our estimates for key factors. And the uh, results uh, are uh, in part shown here. More than 3,000 patients were enrolled over nearly four years. And as you can see, we had really good geographical representativeness in the set of uh, states throughout the US. And we found that viral, uh, rates of viral infection in cancer patients um, were fairly uh, uh, representative of rates in the US cancer population as shown here in the top past HPV about 5%, chronic uh, HPV 0.4%, HCV a little bit higher at 1.9% and HIV also higher uh, ad admittedly because of cancer uh, relationships um, at 1%. But surprisingly, what was really interesting I think and what really stood out is that many patients had um, did not know that they were infected, especially those with past or chronic HPV or H. Uh, or HCV. Also, many patients had no known risk factors for uh, infection. So we concluded that given that many uh, newly diagnosed cancer patients with concurrent HPV or HCV are unaware of their viral infection and have no identifiable risk factors for infection, that screening cancer patients to identify these infections could in fact be warranted and actually a recent uh, subsequent to this uh, pub uh, publication in 2020, uh, ASCO provided a provisional clinical opinion update uh, based uh, in large part on our findings stating that all patients anticipating systemic anti-cancer therapy should be tested for HBV. So it had uh, fairly immediate uh, clinical implications coming out of this study. And I wanted to pivot um, as well to uh, discuss uh, 
in a little more detail uh, the key design and analysis principles for quality of life and patient reported outcomes in clinical trials, which is represented here by this uh, article that uh, I published with my colleague, Dr. Vaija, who's been mentioned, who uh, helps, uh, helps me lead the, uh, the PRO core in SWOG and is the lead administrator for that core. So um, PRO uh, and quality of life evaluations are, um, uh, are, are basically uh, premised upon the idea that we have about 15 million cancer survivors now in, in the US. In fact, uh, PROs uh, um, have kind of exploded in trials in the last five or 10 years, and largely because of that growing cancer survivorship group so there's been a pivot to research in, in the research focus, a pivot towards a patient survivorship. And indeed PROs are designed to reflect the patient survivorship experience by augmenting the assessment of clinical outcomes. The, um, the successful, uh, uh, as Dr. Henry mentioned, the successful incorporation of PROs into clinical trials requires adherence to several basic design principles, including uh, reliance on hypothesis-driven research questions, the use of validated PRO instruments, a consideration of the feasibility of the PRO assessment in the context of the clinical, uh, clinical treatment study with an eye towards minimizing the burden on patients and sites and avoiding bias in the assessment of the PRO, uh, PRO outcomes. I would say overriding the entire uh, um, a design model is the idea that the, um, the questions have to be hypothesis driven. This is really paramount as it aids in the, interp uh, the interpretation of clinical impact. It reduces the possibility of false positive findings and it limits the excessive use of PROs in trial settings, which can be a burden as has been mentioned for both patients and sites. The examination of PRO outcomes must rely on validated instruments. <clears throat> and uh, for those of you who are unfamiliar with uh, the validation uh, um, process, it's really a, a multi-step, very involved process that ensures essentially that what you're measuring is what you intended to measure in, in, in short. Further, uh, PROs have to be feasible within um, a clinical trial. This is aided by a very limited eligibility for the PRO substudy. And while required participation is generally preferred uh, to avoid selection bias, that is required participation in the, in the PRO substudy, it can also be optional if there are accrual concerns to the parent treatment trial. Of course, uh, limited patient and site burden is also going to be a key given potentially limited resources, uh, but also for the sake of the patients who have many demands on them, obviously, and as well as for the sake of the science, since if patients um, are more likely to complete their forms over an extended period, um, well, they will be more likely to complete their forms over an extended period if if, it, uh, if the forms are fairly brief. And uh, this is going to improve the confidence in the findings over the long term because it's gonna minimize missing data. Finally, PRO assessments should start at baseline and its duration in follow-up should be sufficient to detect clinically important changes in quality of life domains, but it should also balance concerns about increasing non-response over the long term. Uh, in part, this can be achieved by aligning the PRO assessments with clinical follow-up visits to make it easier for patients and sites. But importantly as well, PRO assessments, uh, in my view, should not be directly linked to the clinical outcome status, since this can induce a biased uh, in an interpretation. Uh, and in fact, the PRO evaluation really is considered a separate experiment and should be uh, and with a separate type one error and it really should be treated as such uh, in, that, in that context. So this figure illustrates the interrelationships uh, among these design principles. 
and basically reflects how they're all related uh, to each other. Um, and that poor, that appropriate or poor adherence to them can induce a virtuous or a negative uh, cycle respectively. Uh, for instance, uh, the use of hypothesis driven research questions will limit patient burden and enhance feasibility. Whereas if, there, if that hypothesis uh, driven research question is absent, uh, the questions may be cumbersome, scattershot, uh, burdensome, difficult to interpret, uh, et cetera. The, uh, and just to finish with some considerations of the design strategies, the endpoints should be assessed at um, uh, pre-specified follow-up times after trial registration. The sample sizes need to be large enough to allow comparisons by treatment arm with full power. And the primary aim really is to assess differences, arm, differences by arm in the primary PRO scale at pre-specified assessment times, uh, which is designed to reflect clinical relevance. It would be consistent with the, the design and the power calculation, and it aids in clinical interpretation. Four minutes remaining. Thank you. Uh, PRO designs aim to identify a minimally important uh, difference between arms in a specified domain or instrument. <clears throat> An established uh, minimally important difference is preferred. These can typically be found in the literature and uh, will be anchor-based or distribution-based. But if no important, a minimally important difference is available, effect size estimates can be used. Uh, where the effect size from one third to one half of the standard deviation are common. Uh, longitudinal assessments of evaluations over time can also be an important supplement to the primary endpoint and can uh, improve power, although uh, potentially at the risk of informative missing data. And one key consideration, as I mentioned, is, is missing data, which are going to be common and can influence the interpretation. This can be minimized by automated uh, electronic reminder systems and hopefully through uh, electronic PRO platforms going forward. But even the best quality control is not going to prevent uh, missing PRO data. Uh, but these can be, uh, their, their influence can be um, um, mitigated, I would say, to some extent in the analysis by, by considering some, uh, some sensitivity analysis approach, examining the patterns of missingness by co using cohort plots, and uh, if non-random missingness is going to be is apparent, then using pattern mixture models, which is a way of stratifying uh, the analysis by the missingness of patterns. So I'm going to conclude there by saying that uh, uh, PROs that assess symptoms and quality of life are uh, critical to newly planned treatment trials, and they're widely, of course, used in our cancer control and prevention trials as, um, as uh, primary endpoints. Um, the value of uh, PROs has been recognized by the NCI through its support of uh, quality of life scientific committees, its uh, promulgation of an elect electronic PRO platform and the development of patient rated patient reported a symptom toxicity ratings. And finally, um, it's really important that we uh, that when we launch uh, either that when we use PROs either as a primary endpoint or as a secondary endpoint in a treatment trial that we adhere to some really key PRO design and analysis principles which are going to allow a valid interpretation and to identify uh, meaningful differences among different treatment strategies. And as well, it's going to better translate the clinical results to a diverse set of stakeholders. So thank you very much. Muchas gracias, Dr. Unger. Thank so you, Dr. Unger. We got in this uh, design considerations in uh, prevention control trials and the special focus on PROs. Now we will go to the round table. All of the panel members can uh, 
show or, or, or have your camera on. We will have a shorter round table, just 15 minutes. And well, if you have questions, please write them down in the Q and A. Jorge, would you like to read the first one? Dr. Retamales, for Dr. Henry, could the validation of a prom in Spanish, if it is not available, be led by SOG Latin America? Because we would like to participate, and we have been working translating those SOG protocols. Yeah, thank you very much for your question, because there are clearly sometimes questionnaires that we would like to be able to use that we then can't because of the lack of a um, linguistically and psychometrically validated uh, translation. I was wondering if Dr. Unger, though, wanted to address this one because he knows what is um, possible from the SWOG Statistical Center perspective in terms of validating instruments. Uh, so we have done one uh, validation study. It took a long time. Um, what it really, uh, it, it was an instrument to um, uh, improve patient reported outcomes of EGFRI related toxicity, skin toxicity. And um, from my experience, it what it suggested to me is that um, Valid, SWOG is not a very good validation <laughs> instrument validation uh, mechanism uh, as far as the amount of resources that it uh, that it requires for us to do it across a diverse set of studies. Uh, in my view, those those validation efforts are better done at single sites, uh, hopefully. Um, but uh, I would also add, though, that most and 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 Lynn, please uh, feel free to chime in, most of the instruments that we use or that we recommend using, at least in our studies, have a Spanish translation. Um, it would be actually a fairly rare instance where that's not true. Correct me if I'm wrong, Lynn, but that's been my experience. Yeah, that's been my experience whenever we've been trying to put together um, studies. It's it's sort of the, the very specific, more uncommonly used ones that we sometimes run into trouble, but almost everything we've been able to find a validated one. And, and right, and, and if you have an instrument in mind um, that you think is important for your disease setting or whatnot, um, and it hasn't been translated to Spanish, you know, what I, what I would suggest is as a first step, uh, in, in a consideration of a study would be to forward it to our PRO course so that we can evaluate whether or not there isn't already another instrument that's out there that would be uh, as useful um, or perhaps even better than that one. A lot of times the, the fact that it's been uh, translated to Spanish reflects a common usage um, and that it's been used a lot and, and used well. And just a comment, for S1360, S1360, we were lucky. Our instruments were validated in Spanish, but more and more as a chair and, um, and knowing how well Latin American sites can accrue to certain studies, it's important that we look from the very beginning whether, this, whether the surveys that are chosen are, are validated in Spanish it's from, the right, from the beginning. And just to finish that, <laughs> sorry, just to they should, just to finish, I, I, I said how long that study took. It took us 11 years <laughs> to conduct that validation study from, that is, from that is long. publications. Uh, I'm sure it can be done faster uh, locally. Yes, so is it um, SA1? And uh, that is 1316? S1013. Is that what you're thinking of? Yeah. Because there is a question about experience with the centers of S1316, what about adherence to those studies? Patients with uh, palliative care, is it better with the 
uh, clinical oncologist, or it's better with family physicians or specialists in palliative care? And I think that question yeah, is for I, Dr. Krauss. It's an interesting question. I'm not quite sure we were set up to answer that kind of question. We, um, um, you, you know, who the, it really goes through who the site PI, et cetera, and we know who put the patient on, but, um, and, um, but I don't know that we are set up to, to look at that specific question um, as far as who, we, we know who the primary physician are who put the patient on though, we do know that. And almost always they're surgical, gynecologic oncology, sometimes palliative care, not sometimes palliative care physicians. We can look in that, we can look at that more specifically as we're now looking at our data, especially to see if Latin America is different. We can look at that. And if you want to contact me, we can, if someone has an interest, we could look at that. Gracias. Thank you. There is another question to Dr. Unger. In general, patients associate palliative care with end of life care and not with support measures which are done uh, parallel to the treatment. How do you deal with that challenge in the study design so that patients accept that? I'm going to turn most of this over to, to Dr. Krauss, but um, I, I think what you're getting at is, is, is that their um, survival experience is going to be fairly short. So if you want to measure a, a, a clinical outcome or even a PRO outcome, you're going to have to do it very um, shortly after enrollment. And Dr. Krause, maybe you can remind everybody what the assessment times were for S1316, but I would certainly think within the first two weeks and then a month and then two months or something right. like that. Right. And so, okay, so let's say for S1316, they were um, assessed weekly for three months and then monthly, if should they st still be um, alive. And so um, with the same PROs and mainly um, asking if, uh, trying to find out if they had been hospitalized, understanding that many of our patients may come from far away to their uh, larger centers and then may have be hospitalized um, at other places uh, for their bowel obstruction. And that's why the, there was weekly calls to find out that data. Um, so, you know, it's interesting and it's one of the things related to palliative care studies that is potentially a benefit. I mean, you have to be careful about saying that is because there is a short time that they, that, you, you know, before you get your endpoints. And, and so certainly your endpoint um, um, you, you know, targeting your design towards that end, recognizing there'll be missing data, et cetera. And those are all considerations uh, within study design. Bueno, la siguiente pregunta es para la doctora. The next question is for Dr. Henry. Jorge, Jorge. correct me if I don't translate properly. For cancer control studies, what strategies are used to ensure accrual is met? And how do you target and represented population of vulnerable population? Yeah, so I don't know if this question is asking us specifically for how we do this um, when we have studies open in Latin America or how we do this broadly across SWOG. I was going to answer the broadly across, across SWOG first. Um, we do have, um, whenever we are encouraging sites to participate, um, there are a number of NCOR sites um, in the United States which are actually specifically um, for uh, underrepresented minority populations. And that can be um, some sites that are located in inner cities. There's actually also some that are rural 
Um, there's some like in Hawaii, there's, there's a number of different places where we really can try to focus our accrual efforts to try to um, increase the number of patients um, who fall into the um, underrepresented um, heading, depending on how you define that. So there's a number of different ways to define it. The other is we have a recruitment and retention committee, which is very active. And we also have patient advocates who are very active and they can really help us um, reach out to sites that may have a lot of patients. They can help us develop materials uh, to really try to encourage um, participation very broadly and not just in a very limited, um, you know, homogeneous white Caucasian population type of thing. So uh, we do have a number of resources that have been developed through SWOG to try to help. And then I think the other thing is just watching your accrual as you go um, is very important. When we have these monthly meetings, we can assess, are we doing a good job with this? And then finally, there are some studies like the um, S1714 trial that I mentioned, um, Oh, sorry, there's some trials will actually design it so that we want to attain a certain percentage. I don't think S1714, I think, didn't do that. I can't remember. No. Um, but we, we did, um, and there's one that was not a SWOG trial that I got confused with, which was an aromatase inhibitor trial through ECOG, where they actually did specifically say, we want a certain number of patients who are African-American, a certain number of patients who are Asian. Um, and so those are approaches, although we typically haven't done that. We've just tried to achieve our goals without setting absolute benchmarks. Others probably have comments as well. Well, I just want to augment a little bit about the um, patient advocate. Uh, mm -hmm. So we, we, and I know that when I was with survivorship and certainly palliative care, uh, include, try our best efforts to include patient advocates from the very beginning. And then as we have our so we can examine these accrual. I mean, that's where they can be really helpful. And I've learned a lot by working with the patient advocates. And so, and so, and then they're, they're, they should be very active throughout the accrual process because when things go wrong and they invariably do, helping to think things through and, and um, improve accrual, uh, patient advocates can be very helpful and thoughtful one of the reasons why I think it's important within each Latin American country and each, you know, uh, National Cancer Institute that there are patient advocates that can potentially help with the accrual process. Y hasta ahora han trabajado con eh, representantes de pacientes, patient advocates en los sitios en Latinoamérica. Have you worked with patient advocates in sites in Latin America? Do you have experience with patient advocates? Well, I think that, um, and in, in preparing for this presentation um, and with SWOG, it is one of the things they wanted me to make sure I said is that this is what they, that this is a target where they really want to involve Latin American patient advocates. SWOG as a, as a group has more patient advocate involvement than any of the others by far. And so um, it really is something that um, it is something we, uh, recognize the importance and hope to uh, improve over time. Gracias. Thank you. Una pregunta al panel. A question to the panel. To what extent the evidence quality of life studies can collect can cancel out beneficial effects that treatment can have that uh, justify the personal decision by the patient of not uh, doing treatment that are biological beneficial, but uh, cause uh, or are negative for their quality of life. It's a really interesting question. That I'm sure Joe knows. It's It sort of goes to what uh, Jeff Sloan and others have been working on the was it worth it um, to say, okay, you had improvement survival, but was it worth it because you may have greater morbidities? People are, are, are looking at publishing that. It's a hard question to answer though, as far as the, um, especially the studies that we're doing, which are focusing on a lot on, on quality of life as, as major endpoints. I would just add that for, I would say that in most cases, you know, the PRO, patient reported outcomes, the quality of life considerations, uh, 
are most influential when you know two treatment strategies are approximately similar in terms of their clinical outcomes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would agree with that. Um, when you're really when you're not making a real trade off in terms of the treatment um, per se and the treatment outcomes per se, but you're really trying to help the patient feel better. I think knowing a lot more about the patient experience during the treatment is quite helpful. I think the other thing that's just sort of unique about a lot of symptom management trials is that we do end up with a big component of placebo effect. Um, and that's something that we're trying to study in some of our trials, because if half of, if, if you have two random, two groups that are randomized and the group that gets the interventional drug, you know, 70% of them get better, but the group that gets the placebo, 50% of them get better. Um, you want to learn a little bit about how can you try to leverage that because you might be able to achieve um, good symptom control without causing too many side effects if you can uh, learn why people get a placebo effect. So. Y una consulta relacionada a la influencia del... And a question about uh, the uh, bias influence. How do you manage reporting bias associated to demographic differences or risk factors in such different populations? Maybe that question is for Joe to start with. Definitely. <laughs> uh, reporting bias uh, as it relates, well, we try, to, we try to minimize reporting bias overall. As I mentioned, we have fairly extensive efforts that are put into electronic reminder systems, um, queries to sites, retrospectively to see if they've uh, um, see if they've collected the data although a lot of times it's too late at that point um, but as it relates specifically in a sense if if the if the the missing data is is informative which is what you're referring to that is to say it's um, it differs between different groups who could have different clinical outcomes on average or different pro outcomes that's really an issue certainly so what we'll do is, um, uh, you know, we have um, we have these uh, evaluative techniques that we try to employ to figure out whether or not there is a relationship there, um, and if there is, you know, to some extent you can't do much. There, there's only a limited amount you can do when it comes to when it comes to missing data, um, but using pattern mixture models as one as one example uh, of a way to uh, uh, account for uh, different uh, different uh, response patterns and different clinical outcome patterns that could influence missing data is is a key sensitivity analysis that we use. Um, our hope is that going forward, um, this will become even less of an issue as we begin to employ electronic patient reported outcome systems going forward which would be a way of patients simply being able to use a, a device to report their, um, their uh, symptom status or their, their quality of life, which would make it easier for everybody. I would add just to sum up, um, you know, one, one key consideration from my perspective as we in SWAG evaluate the implementation of electronic patient reported outcomes is whether or not the response patterns differ by age, which is, a critical issue give, if older patients are less likely to use a device or an online system to report their patient reported outcomes. So that's something we're, we're evaluating now. So it's something we take very seriously, but there's not an easy answer in, in summation. Muchas gracias, Joe. Um, Thank you very much, Joe. Now we have to end the discussion. I think that uh, there are some questions and we can send them to the panelists. Thank you very much for your contribution to this panel. Now I'm going to give the floor to Dr. Crowley to close the conference. He was <laughs> of the Statistic Sec uh, Center of CRAB. Now he's the head of a strategic partnerships and much of the impulse of the initiative of SWAG in Latin America
comes from his vision about international collaboration. John, you recognized. Thank you so much, Daisha. Can you hear me? Yes. I'd like to thank all the attendees who were in our virtual audience over the course of this week. We've tried to convey some information about the cancer burden in Latin America and what we can do together to alleviate that burden through clinical trials and prevention, treatment, symptom management, and palliative care. I urge all the panelists to, excuse me, all the attendees to reach out to any of the speakers that you've seen on the screen in this past week so that we make this engagement sustainable and that our collaboration doesn't end with the end of this conference. I'd like to also thank uh, my team here at CRAB, our wonderful host in front of the screen, Dasya, Kristen, as well as the great work by those behind the curtain, Arthur, Karu, Kurt. And finally, my thanks to our collaborators at Gochi. Thanks to Bettina Muller and her group, to all the moderators and speakers that she lined up, uh, to people who did all the work behind the scenes at Gochi, including Javier Retamales and Dario Cuevas. And finally, to my wonderful uh, collaborator, Bettina Muller, my heartfelt thanks. I hope our collaborations will continue in the future in person and not just virtually. Thanks again. So back to you, Dasha, and please uh, attendees do remember to fill out the poll to evaluate the previous session as well as the whole conference experience. Thank you. Bueno, muchas gracias a todos por su asistencia. Thanks to everyone for attending these four days. Thanks to the panel members for their contribution.